So in uh, 2018, the Municipal Building Committee actually uh, was tasked by the Select Board to put together uh, a list of priorities for the town. And the number one priority at that time was public safety. So they had put together three different plans of, of what they wanted to do. And one of them was how we were going to handle the North Station with uh, the old uh, park and rec building and fire station going out of business. So they're being sold. So you kind of got the little bird's eye view of our, our station there. And so this is uh, prior to the building. That's that whole lot there is uh, what the town had purchased prior to approving that. Um, this is the overhead view of the station. It's about 5,500 square feet. And uh, we kind of just did a walkthrough. So that's our entryway. And we have a small training meeting room that folks are welcome to sign up if you have a smaller group. Um, it says it holds uh, about 20, 25 people comfortably. Uh, then we walk into our kitchen area. So we have an area, this is considered one of our cooling. Oh, thank you. This is one of our, it's considered a cooling warming center. So if we had to open it up to North Hadley residents or Hadley residents, we'd have the ability to do some light cooking there. It's also an opportunity for the department to get together and, and meet at our meetings. Um, so we have a small, you know, small table in here to, to sit at. Uh, this is also an alternate operation center, so that training room also acts as a place where we can have multiple TVs set up so that we can monitor the weather. We have uh, all our stuff with the Massimons Management Agency that we usually have up on the sets, so we can actually use that as an alternate site. Uh, we have a small chief officer's uh, room where they can do their their work. Uh, I'm going to remain at the center station for right now, but um, if we do need space, we could actually put an officer up in there. But right now, they fill up on reports and, and have access to that. <clears throat> this is their rear entry, and we did build this out with an anticipation that in the next 20 years, for the way Hadley's growing, that we may need to have a full-time department for an ambulance. Um, so we have two bunk rooms. Also, we do staff. So last night up until about 8 o'clock, we had uh, probably about 10 members of the department on, on duty at the station, call force and full-time covering for those storms that were coming through. So we put in some sleeping quarters because there are times when we're staying overnight when there's, you know, the snowtober that we had back in 2016, or 11 or 14 or whatever it was. <laughs> Uh, we had staff that were actually sleeping at the station, so this would allow us to be able to, to handle that. This is the uh, alternate dispatch center. So we have a dispatch center at the center station. If that center station ever should go down, uh, where we get all our 911 calls and police and fire are dispatched out of, they can come into this space and it's all redundant and interconnected between the two. So they could literally walk into this space, set up some laptops, and be fully operational to be able to continue 911 operations and, and dispatching police and fire. There's also some work area here for the firefighters to work on, and then the TV sets again are for, uh, just for current information, uh, for monitoring weather. There's also one for security, the security cameras that are around the building. Um, and then we have, uh, we have some computer equipment for them, and then you know, phones, everything else. The building's fully generated, has generated power, so if the if the we do lose primary power, everything in the station is, is under generated power. And then this is the apparatus bay. Uh, we had originally spec'd out a three bay, but we didn't feel it was necessary. Um, we've kind of combined vehicles. So as of right now, we have our tanker truck, which we received from the state that we fixed up ourselves. Um, you can see these little lines, this is what we were talking about when we presented to the town when we were requesting. Those are the plumbing vents that actually suck the exhaust from the trucks out. So we put these right direct to the truck. So our firefighters aren't being exposed, exposed to that diesel uh, exhaust, which, um, you know, my generation of firefighters, the, the cancer rate is just enormous right now. And one of the reasons is because we didn't realize how bad it was to have all this exhaust going in the spaces that we work out of. So, 
This little truck here is a 1962 uh, Dodge Power Wagon that was put together by uh, fire department members um, and the association, Myron Chuzik, uh, was instrumental along with Johnny Mitch Sr. They worked on that and that truck is actually still in service. It was actually, believe it or not, it's actually mutual aid uh, first due to East Hampton for their mills because we can drive this little piece anywhere we want to and it's basically a big deck ton of water. We just feed it with water and it, it, it'll drive anywhere. So it's actually still in service. And then we finally found a home for the hose wagon that's been in either barns or, or garages. So this is the Hockenham hose wagon number four. Uh, the West family uh, presented it to the, uh, the fire department a number of years ago and we never really had a place to display it. So we purposely designed that space on top of our gear storage area so that we can actually let people come in and, and check it out. It's, I mean, that's what we used to respond to fires in and uh, it's a piece of town town history, so we kind of have a place to display it. So we have a mezzanine for storage, uh, and there's a small weight room up there. Um, and then we have, uh, he's heading over to the locker storage. So we separated, oh, I guess he did, he did go up there, okay. So our firefighters were trying to keep them in shape. The strenuous work environments that we deal with, um, they need, to, they need to stay in shape, so we have uh, some simple weights, and then they design it so it's actually working muscle groups that firefighters. So we're pulling, we're using axes, so they've put together equipment that, that works for that. We have also treadmills for cardio and, and for legs. Um, and then you can see down on the bay, that's our, this is the pumper that we had talked about when we stepped out the building, because this truck used to be in our center station because it wouldn't fit in the old north. The old north station was too small. Um, all the new trucks today are just, they're, there's so much stuff on them, there's so many requirements of it. The exhaust systems are so, so big, everything's a lot bigger. So this truck is now the primary pumper for that north station. And so that's what responds to the north end of town. Uh, those are all our old trophies from all the parades that they used to go out in. And uh, you know, this, there's a lot of history in the fire department that we're finally able to actually put out so folks can see it. This is the turnout gear room. So um, these lockers were generously donated from the University of Massachusetts. They used to be the football lockers or lacrosse or something. They were in great shape, so we, we, uh, we took them and Clean them up, and now each, each firefighter has a locker up there, and they've been very useful. So that was a great add to us. That's the generator that we uh, we were talking about for generating power. Uh, the building is uh, it's powered by propane, so propane is for heat um, and and for the generated power. And then uh, basically you have the. The tobacco barn over there, that's also part of the town's property now, and DPW and fire and police we store some uh, big trailers and stuff in the winter um, just to get it out of the way. And then John was nice enough to let us uh, show you a little demo of us pulling out of the station and, and it's actually worked out quite well. You know, we, there was some concerns about the, the distance that we had to back in and pull out and it's all, it's all worked out really nicely. So. Um, we're really, really happy and, and proud that we, we have this for you. And um, I, I think it's, it's going to be able to allow us to grow too. We're not going to be coming back and asking you for another day anytime soon. This is, this is something that's going to stand the test of time, in, in my opinion. Um, it allows for, you know, if residents need a small space to, to meet, you know, if, if this room is too big for you, you know, there's a small room you're welcome to. It's secure. There's bathrooms there. Um, and my biggest part of me was we have probably about 22 or 24 call force firefighters right now and then we have six full-time people so during the hours of 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. we have full-time staff on and then after that it goes back to call force and myself and the deputy and they, they, need a, they need a place that they have gear that's clean, gear that's up to date, because these are the folks that are going out at two or three in the morning when you know they're coming home after a full day of work and then getting up to go out to these calls. And 
Uh, I just, I don't want to be the chief that has firefighters that are, that are getting sick. And so that's why we really incorporated making sure that the exhaust is getting taken out of the building, that they have a place to clean their gear. Our gear is, it, it just gets nasty, the stuff we're exposed to. And, and also we have, uh, we actually made sure that we had a, a shower that they can come back and shower in. So that they're, they're making sure that they're getting all that nasty, all those carcinogens off of them. It's not like when we used to have the papers and paper and wool and natural fibers and everything. Everything is plastic now and the stuff is just, it's killing, it's killing us. And whether it's in, in the car fires that we go, the dumpster fires, whatever it is. So we want to make sure we do whatever we can to keep them safe. So that's what we have. Does anybody have any questions until you can get up into the North Station? Where's the fire pole? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> So because the bedrooms were on the first floor, we'd have to slide up to the second. So <laughs> there was actually a change. Uh, they actually had started removing fire poles from stations uh, because there were a lot of ankle injuries. So they were getting up and sliding down, and, you know. Uh, but then they found out that it's really not that bad having the fire pole because running down the stairs, you still have the same issues uh, of only falling down concrete stairs. So they kind of it's a mixed match of fire poles and non fire poles. So, but neither of our stations have holes. <laughs> it's just so nice to see something so modern. I mean, we're, Hadley has got so many old junky buildings. That's just a thing of beauty. This and this too. It was everything. It's like beautiful. We really appreciate your support on that. Like, it was a long time coming, and it was. It took a lot of planning. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but the original proposal for the station was next to the old Park and Rec and Fire Department in that ball field. That was the original proposed one. It was it was extremely tight. So, and you know, being able to find that piece of property that we can expand on with you know the town needs to put a softball field in or whatever they decide to do, it's that's the town's now. It's really it's really nice. It's beautiful up there. I want to first of all thank all you residents of Hadley for not having any fires today, because <laughs> <laughs> oh, he wouldn't be here. I did volunteer to light the fireplace for him so he'd feel at home, but he declined. <laughs> All right, Mike, the first question and the most important in my view, how the heck do you say your last name? <laughs> the English version is Spanknabel. Spanknabel, yes. so and accent on the second syllable. Yes, and in German it's Spanknabel. So Spannabel. it's actually a tool that's, span it's a spanner tool for a drum, to tighten a drum. Really? Yes. Did you have an ancestor who was a drummer? Actually, my, my father's family, all of them were musicians. My grandmother was a pianist. My grandfather was a German mounted military band conductor and um, played the trumpet and many other, other instruments. And uh, my grandmother, during the war, she actually played in, she played in bars for U.S. soldiers and that's how she made money to feed the family. And, my father at the same time, um, you know, he grew up in World War II and um, he, used, he had to take care of his younger siblings because uh, his father was missing in action and so he took the reins and used to, told me he used to pick up old cigarette butts from the U.S. soldiers and then re-roll them so he could sell them and, and buy some bread for the family and, and then his, his dream was to originally to be a priest and he then decided that he wanted to share his passion with people and he decided to become a physician. So um, he went to college in Germany and then came over to the United States in 1950s, the 1950s and, um, and started, uh, he trained in Worcester at the Worcester Memorial Hospital, which is now UMass Memorial and became a gastroenterologist and actually trained in Japan and brought over a laser for uh, colonoscopies, which hopefully everybody's had one because he <laughs> gave me one for my birthday when I turned 30. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, that's where he, he, <laughs> and that's where he met my mother. My mother was a nurse at oh. Wilson Memorial. And, and, and then there you were. Yeah, and then there it was. And I grew up in Sterling, Mass, a small little, we had a small horse farm. We raised, we had Morgan horses and a bunch of other farm animals. And, and uh, so I worked on the family farm. I actually worked for a farmer who really worked me, taught me everything I know today. And 
and then I, uh, I graduated high school and decided to go to the University of Massachusetts. So, you know, the vision I have is all little boys want to be firemen, right? And that's one of the stereotypes. What happened to you? When did it come? Actually, uh, I always wanted to be a firefighter, believe it or not. And actually, <laughs> the, the carpenter who actually uh, built out my parents' home, um, he was actually the fire chief in Sterling. And he kind of took me under his wing too. And I always, I always thought I could, I could never be a firefighter. I mean, they, they used to march with the, you know, the uniforms on and and everything else. And so it really wasn't something that I ever thought that I would be able to accomplish. But um, I actually, when I went to the University of Massachusetts, um, I actually graduated with a degree in uh, natural sciences. And I actually started in wood technology and forestry, fisheries, wildlife, biology, and um, from that I became a carpenter. <laughs> so uh, I started a com company up here. I met my wife at the University of Massachusetts. We worked for, we worked at the campus center. Um, I worked on the 11th floor bartending to pay my, my bills, and she worked on the 10th floor in the catering department, and uh, the Navala family became a part of my family, <laughs> and Hadley, um, in all honesty, in my mind, when I, I actually moved into Hadley, uh, probably around 1990, I lived 1990. on Russell Street. Yeah. And, um, Was she just, from Hadley, Mike? She actually grew up in Belcherton, okay. uh, but the family homestead is uh, on Route 9, uh, where Primo Pizza is. The White House was the, the family was homestead. Family home? 13 children grew up there, and they're all over the place here now. <laughs> the numbers are dwindling a little bit, but, uh, so this, this town just, uh, it reminded me of Sterling, but I think it, it had five or ten layers extra to it, so I fell in love with it, and I felt that I found a great place, I found a great family, my wife was, well, you, you, I don't know if any of you have met her, but she's the town clerk, and, mm -hmm. you know, we worked in town, we had, we took over the Nabal, the family, mm -hmm. um, Used to be there, one of the original grocery stores in Hadley, but then it was a package store. So my wife and I ran that for a few years, and then that's when I found out that there was a call force fire department in town. So some of the folks that came in, they were on the call force, and they they said, "Hey, any interest in, in joining the department?" And I said, "Huh? <laughs> I could be I could be a firefighter." And they said, "Absolutely." So in 1998, uh, about November. Um, Signed on the dotted line uh, as a volunteer firefighter, and uh, the following following uh, in 1999, I believe, was my first scary structure fire. It was the first church. Um, I don't know if you remember the first church. They had a mulch fire. Uh, they think maybe a cigarette butt or something, and started it. Started going up the steeple. It was about as hot as it was yesterday, um, and. I just remember I'd never had a set of firefighter gear on, and I drove over to the call with one of the trucks, and it was kind of like you either sink or swim, <laughs> you swim or you sink. <laughs> so I put my gear on, and I climbed up the ladder, started cutting a hole in the side of the building, and that was history. I, I, what kind of training do you get, Mike, as a, as a volunteer fireman that's led you to fire chief? Yep. So what we have is you start out basically as we call it now your probationary. So you, you go through some basic training and that allows the chief to actually decide and for you to decide if this is something you want to pursue because the training is, is intense. Um, so I took that basic training, I enjoyed it, I was able to put a mask on my face, I was able to put all this equipment on. You know, we're carrying close to 65 pounds of equipment on ourselves. Um, so it's, it's a toll. Uh, especially when you're in a real heated situation like that. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of training and uh, flashover training and search and rescue training, hazmat training. And within the first year of becoming a firefighter, you have to become certified as a first responder as well. So you have to learn basic, you know, first aid and stuff like that. So it's a lot. Yeah. So that's one of the issues we're seeing today is all that time it takes to do that. It's, it can limit what call and volunteer firefighters can accomplish. Um, so right now, we have what's called the Hampshire Basic Six, and it's six classes. That's, oh, okay. And okay. it's, we hosted it at, at the North Station. It used to be at the Old North Station. And it's six classes that go through 
basically how to put your air packs on, put your turnout gear on. It goes through how to operate our ladders and just basic of basic. And then the last day, we actually take them into a burn building. We expose them to temperatures that are anywhere from 700 to 900 degrees. They get to see how fire develops. Um, so if you arrive on a scene of a house fire, you know what you're looking at, what to expect, and they get a taste of it. And it's at that point where they can figure out if they're comfortable or not. Because you're, you know, if you're claustrophobic, if you're, if you don't like it being dark. Um, you know, the shows that you watch with the pretty flames and all that when the firefighters go in, it, it, is, it is the worst possible, it's the worst possible space you could ever be in as a fire. And I, I can tell you, it's, it's, it's just awful. Um, we're lucky if we get there and there's nice flames rolling. So, um, anyways, so I went through that and then I went into the, the state's program. So the state's program gets you certified. So. In 2004, I think it was, I spent six months because I was still a call volunteer. Mm -hmm. So Tuesday, Thursday nights, and then Saturdays and Sundays, I would be training. And it was about six months of training, about 320 hours. Um, went through even more intense training in paramilitary style, climbing up and down ladders, ropes and knots, how to use foam, everything. So I received my national certification. Are you are you looking for volunteers in our group here? Maybe is there any, absolutely yeah? <laughs> anybody who's ready to sign up. To <laughs> so. You bring me to a thought, Mike, uh, when you talk about the situation, and it isn't like it is on TV or movies. Is it too much to ask you to talk about maybe the worst situation you can remember you and or your department being in? Sure. Is that okay to ask you? Sure, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Tell us. So, so, um, so nowadays, like we're, I was explaining to you about how quickly fire grows now because of everything being plastic and everything, we don't have a lot of time to get to fires. And, um, you know, we've, we've, had some, we've had some fatalities, we've had some fires where folks haven't made it, and it's, it's not a great thing. In Hadley? In Hadley, oh yeah. Um, and, you know, one of them was actually on um, on Huntington Road, and you know, it was it was a bad situation. It was a well-developed fire before we got there, and unfortunately, one person perished. Um, that's why I've been, you know, when I became chief in 2013, they asked me to put together a 10-year phase-in plan, and the town has been amazing with doing that. But we have we don't have. 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, like you used to have when I first started. You had some time for fire to develop. Again, with everything the way it burns now, if you aren't out of your home, so if that's why we're so strict about smoke detectors, where they're located, that they're the right type, you have minutes. You're talking three to five minutes to get out of your house before you guys are gonna have a real difficult time crawling yourself out. Not walking, but crawling. Because the smoke just, it, it knocks you, it completely knocks you down. It's, it's so accurate and terrible. It's just, you, your body just can't, can't handle it. So um, that's why bringing the full-time fire staff on here has been enormous. We're able to get to the fire. We're rolling out the door as soon as the call comes in. Um, Route 9, uh, probably six months ago, we had a basement fire. Uh, so fire going in the basement, something happened electrically, and we got on scene, two of the firefighters off in turnout gear. We had a report of two pets in the basement, two dogs. Um, really nasty smoke coming up out of the basement, and instantly we're in, just sprayed some water on it quick to try and cool it down, and we carried two dogs out, got them, got them to the ambulance, started giving them oxygen, and those two little dogs, one was this little tiny little bulldog looking thing, he's 14 years old, and he was kind of coughing and choking a little bit. He took a visit to the vet, I got to see him the other day, he's ornery as ever, and just, <laughs> and then there was a, another dog too also that, that made it. So time does matter, um, especially overnight. So that's, so right now you have call force firefighters overnight. Yeah. Um, so it takes time, They're, we're home sleeping, 
Uh, folks are with their families, so when the call comes in for a fire or an accident, we have to get up, put our clothes on, get in the car, drive to the station, put our turnout gear on. So you're probably looking at a 10 to 15 minute response time before. So if you think about the seconds I was just telling you about, three to five minutes for fire to, to develop, and it, it puts us behind the eight ball. So we have, to, we have to work even quicker when we get there. So that's why we train every other week, and we're constantly recruiting new folks. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why I offered these people to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that's that's a challenge we face. Do we have a lot of fires now? We don't, but we have to be prepared for when it happens. Uh, so, like, if you were to give advice to people, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in my house and I realize my bacon grease is just gone up in flames, whatever it is, you know, the curtain has caught fire. What's your best advice to all of us about handling ourselves if we find ourselves in that situation? So if you if you have an incident, you, you have to, common sense prevails. So if you feel that it's something that you can handle, so we have, we go out and we present to, you know, to senior, uh, to seniors at Winfield, because we have a lot of calls for burnt toast and things like that, but if you have a fire on the stove, obviously we have our program called Stand By Your Pan, so you're not leaving your pan on the stove if you're not there watching it. Um, put a lid on it, so if you have a fire on the stove, don't grab the cup of water. I mean, believe it or not, some people do that, or they try and take the pan, throw it in the sink, or bring it outside, and they end up you know, really making a bad situation worse. Um, so you kind of have to size that up yourselves. Uh, if you have a fire inside your stove, should you open up the stove? No. no. Leave the stove cl closed and shut the stove off and get us out there and we'll help you exhaust the, you know, the smoke out. So it's, a lot of it's common sense, but you have to make that decision if you want to try and do something. If you're not feeling comfortable, if that smoke is really going and that fire is really going, our priority is your safety and getting you out and we will get there as quickly as we can to do the best we can to manage it. So, my, my opinion is if you don't feel like you can handle it with what you have, because uh, a lot of people don't have a fire extinguisher in their house or they have a little small one like this, doesn't go very far, you know, you have to make that, that decision. But just remember you're the important thing, not, not the stuff. <laughs> What's your recommendation on the fire extinguisher? You know, I, that's what I got. I don't know what you all have, but I got a little fire extinguisher. Yeah. Yeah, if you can, if you can have a fire extinguisher, obviously don't, don't put it like right next to the stove, but you know, in another cabinet away from it so you can actually go to the fire with your extinguisher and put it out. Uh, they have smaller ones that, you know, they're, they're rated for a kitchen. They're usually white. It's called a K-class extinguisher for kitchen class. And you can pick them up at Walmart or whatever. And, you know, it's a wet agent. It's not a powder. Um, so it's designed to actually smother the fire. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a useful, useful thing that can, if you catch it quick enough. Would you put one in every room? I mean, no. No, no. One fire extinguisher? One fire extinguisher in the kitchen, and I mean, if you wanted to put one, maybe, I mean, the way we look at it, uh, if we're inspecting a commercial property, um, the code requires that you have one within five feet of an exit door. So you don't <laughs> want to have to, you don't want to trap yourself in a corner with a fire extinguisher. You want it somewhere where you can get out. So if you have a cabinet near the door, or going out into the garage, or maybe right inside the garage, Somewhere that you have a way to get back out, so you're not you're not trapping yourself. Good. Which is true in this building too. If you ever need the fire extinguisher, you can get out the door. Yep. There's several of them. I was going to say maybe we should locate them. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you, I'm sure. Back There's one right there by the door. <laughs> one by the kitchen door. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good. Um. We went kind of backwards. I want to do and ask one more thing about your family because I mm -hmm. understand you have a couple of great kids. I do. Tell us about them. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Pops, this is your chance. <laughs> I'm very, very blessed. Uh, and my children and, and Jessica, my wife, have been very patient with me because going out the door all the time. Mm -hmm. um, this lovely pager here <laughs> is on my belt all the time, um, along with a lot of the other department members. and. When this thing wakes you up at two in the morning and you have to go out the door, um, or you're at the birthday party, or if you're out to dinner and you know nobody's going, uh, you know we have we've we've signed up for that. So, and I can tell you that I actually 
Brock, one of my children, who's actually on duty today. He's actually a call force firefighter, but he's filling in for one of the full timers. So my son Gage is, is over there. Um, he's Ooh, gone. Hi. He's gone what through the basic training, <laughs> and he's with uh, another fine gentleman, our lieutenant today. That's Brian Washkevitz, and you know Hadley Hadley uh, Washkevitz. <laughs> Hadley Washkevitz, and uh, I, I can't tell you how our our department is just fabulous. We have just I, I, I I'm telling you I'm, I don't I I'm gonna brag. You, have, you should be very proud of that was permission the folks. Um, about your book, yeah. about your kids. I got my kids, department. yeah. Yeah, but our department, we have a lot of really great folks that really, really care. You know, they live in town and they want to they be a part of it. They do the training and they're showing up at night. Um, my son Gage actually started the junior firefighter program at Hopkins with another Hopkins graduate, Liam Higgins. And so they put together a program that's bringing in uh, you know, 15 to 18 year olds to give them just a basic taste of this so that we're, you know, we're bringing in recruits. So they put that program together. It's a nationally recognized program. We follow national standards and we actually just recruited three additional uh, juniors that will be doing, uh, two of them are from Hopkins Academy. they will be seniors coming up next year. And one of them is Hampshire Regional and they'll be coming in to do some programs with us. Uh, and we've actually brought that public safety program into Hopkins. So you remember the days of having shop and having uh, Polmac and things like that. Uh, there's not a lot of that in Hopkins Academy right now, so they're trying to put programs together that show alternatives for, uh, for students if they don't want to, you know, you know, you have math and English, everything that's important, but uh, we, we do what's called Public Safety One, and it gives them a little glimpse of police, fire, EMS, uh, building inspections, emergency management, That's and terrific. all that stuff. So every year we've, we've been in, unfortunately COVID kind of messed up last year, but yeah. we're back on track. Well, it was funny because I was thinking today when I was doing my bills, the best course I think I ever had in high school was business law. Because it's practical, because I use it. And I think what you're talking about is wonderful. I have my daughter too. Oh, uh, yeah, so, yo. Uh, and by the way, there's a girl, this woman. <laughs> and my daughter Sloan, she's been very helpful too. So she volunteers all the time. She was the Easter Bunny and spent five hours in the back of our fire truck in a Easter Bunny outfit and almost passed out. I felt so bad. About it. <laughs> but just to bring some, you know, some cheer to the town during a really bad time. And but you could have helped so. her if she had, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about. Um, the structure of the department and the programs of the department. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, as of right now, so in 2018 was the big transition year. Um, 2018, we brought on four full-time firefighters. So that what is what that entails is there's two firefighters on the floor, a lieutenant and a firefighter, and then myself and the deputy. Um, so from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., you have a minimum of two that are on duty in the station. Um, I, I work daily, and then weekends I'm on call, or my deputy's on call, after hours we're on call, um, and then 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. it goes back to call force. So that's the makeup. Uh, it's been working out very well. Do you have volu the, the volunteers, is that the call force? The call force, yeah. Is, is your volunteers. volunteers, how many volunteers did you say? That we have about 22 or 24 listed now. Wow. Um, so the numbers have gone up. They, mm -hmm. We had a real drop. Um, so we have that number 24, but the number that are actually responding during the day or at night, I should say, might be two to four. It's not everybody's available. Um, so you know, we have some folks that are really committed to it. We have others that are, you know, you go, you go home after a full day of uh, roofing or plumbing or electrical work and. It's hard to get up and go out to a smoke detector or a carbon monoxide alarm, so it's it's a challenge. So, I think that's probably one of the next phases down the road, and we're we're working on that. I'll talk about that with when you ask the questions. Next question: um, How we? <laughs> Why don't I ask that now? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <it's> okay. <laughs> Whatever that question was, Mike, take it. <laughs> so you were we were talking the about future. the ambulance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in June of 2018, uh, the town of Hadley decided to go put out an RFP. So we used to have Amherst Fire uh, was our ambulance service. Um, they would respond from Amherst to our community. Great service, paramedic level service. 
Uh, but what we were seeing was that because of our call volume, the increase in calls, you know, we're responding to you know 1,500 calls a year, um, 700 paramedical, um, so a lot. <laughs> so we were adding that to their plate, and they were already they're already overwhelmed. So they cover the towns of Shutesbury and Leverett, and uh, they were covering Sunderland. And then in Hadley, and we're you know we're about 20% of their calls, and we were seeing that we were seeing a lot of mutual aid ambulances coming in for them. We were seeing delay in ambulances because they were coming from Belgiumtown or Northampton. So in 2000, we've had I can't remember how many ambulance studies committees we've had, but we did one in 2008. We gave recommendations to the select board. 2011, another committee was put together. We started putting together a recommendation for requests for proposals from companies. And then in 2017, we put that proposal out and we received one bid back and that was Action Ambulance. So Action Ambulance, uh, they answered everything in our request and agreed to do everything in our request. So what that meant to us is we would have a, an advanced level ambulance, or a paramedic level ambulance in our station, responding 24 seven and out the door. So our normal response time when we had Amherst was between eight to 15 minutes. Our response time now average from time of 911 call is four and a half to five and a half minutes. Out the to door? To the door, to the door of the patient. Oh, to the door of the patient? Yes. Yes. Wow. So, I mean, unless it's, you know, during the, during the winter, things slow down because you, you know, sure. but um, so time is of essence when we're, we're going to these calls. The, the crews that we have, um, the fire chief, myself, I'm under full control of that ambulance. So anything that happens with it goes through, through me. And we have an oversight committee as well that reviews all the calls. If there's ever a call that exceeds 10 minutes for the response time, they have to tell us why. They have to provide us documents as to why it happened. Um, and if it's nothing, you know, if it's a snowstorm or if it's, you know, it's all the way up at the end of Hockenham and, you know, there was something going on, then they have to justify that. Mm -hmm. And every month we get a report of that and uh, they're very strict on that and so are we. Uh, any complaints from residents, if there's an issue on care, comes back to that oversight committee and is addressed immediately. And then the other positive part of it is part of the contract um, includes a reimbursement to the town. So right now we pay an annual fee to Action Ambulance. The first year was $267,000 for them to provide us ALS service. And the contract stated that when they reached milestones of revenue, that they would start giving us money back. So the first year we received the entire $267,000 back from Action Ambulance. Mm -hmm. And so that was a very, very positive thing to see. Absolutely. Last year with COVID, mm -hmm. the call volume people, it was, believe it or not, people were afraid to go to the hospital or doctors were saying, you know, don't go to the hospital, stay at home. And um, so our call volume decreased. So the 200 plus thousand dollar uh, contract that we had for last year, uh, we still received a return of 138,000. So not as much as we did the first year, but we had, I think we were about 150 calls less than the previous year. What were we paying Amherst? So Amherst, um, I mean, we had started out, I think around 40,000 back in the day, then it went up to 80, it was up to 115, then 145. And the year we put out the RFP, they were requesting and saying they were giving us a deal. This is not having an ambulance in our station. Um, this is them responding to our town. They were looking at $375,000 they wanted to charge us. And that was with no rebate. That was, um, that was what they felt they, that, that's what they felt their costs were. So that's why we, we kind of got at that tipping point where we felt we needed to take a look and see what we had. And, uh, the paramedics and EMTs that we have at our station are, they literally fight to work in Hadley, um, <laughs> but they know how the oversight is, but they, they, they really like working here. 
and I think we've proven it with the care, the patient care. Uh, we are constantly in contact with Dr. Morse, he is our uh, emergency room doctor at Cooley Dickinson, to make sure that our paramedics are providing the care that they need uh, to provide. Uh, there, there's no paramedics that can work in this town unless they actually do hands-on time with Dr. Morse in the emergency room so that they know how things happen. Uh, so we really, really have a, a, thumb, a thumb on it to make yeah. sure that we're not, we're not messing up. Well, it sounds like full-time job. I hear that. But it's only part of what you do. Yes. You go out to fires, you've got the ambulance service, mm -hmm. and? Emergency management. Emergency management. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. So the emergency management side, uh, flooding, storms, uh, wind-driven storms, planning, uh, sheltering, all that kind of stuff, COVID. Uh, Maybe you weren't aware, but we actually had a declaration of a state of emergency for the town of Hadley for a year. Uh, it started March of last year and was just, um, we just got rid of it uh, probably a month or two ago. But um, as the emergency management director, it's my job to provide information to the chair of the select board and town administration and the full select board mm -hmm. with recommendations of how to, how to manage emergencies. Okay. So, in Hadley, our biggest concerns are flooding. So we have annual flooding on Aquavita and Honeypot. Uh, we do have some years where it gets, we get a little bit antsy when it, we have, if we have a heavy winter and we have heavy snows up to the north of us. Um, we've had a few times where we've put berms up over on Aquavita um, and sandbags and sandbagged uh, drainage swales just to keep the water back. Uh, but all that stuff, we are doing plans. We have plans for it, and we update continually. continually. So um, that's another part of the job. So in your downtime, when you're sitting there smoking your pipe. <laughs> I can't smoke. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> State law. <laughs> uh, you have to do residential inspections, commercial inspections, mm -hmm. smoke detector. And yes. That's another piece of your job? Correct. So under Mass General Law, Chapter 148, Fire Laws, we, we do all the inspections, including the, the crew. Uh, we inspect any home before it's sold. That's required. We have to check to make sure that there's proper smoke detectors and carbon monoxide alarms in them. Uh, we do all commercial inspections. There's a long laundry list of ones that are required uh, under state law, so bars, uh, cinemas are required annually, some are required quarterly um, for life safety. Uh, I do all plan reviews for new sprinkler systems, so the sprinkler systems that you have in this building, fire alarms, uh, we do oil burner inspections, oil tank inspections, propane tank, transfer tanks, tanks on trucks, uh, gas station inspections, um, if somebody needs to do explosives, uh, all that is under the fire department. Uh, we issue land licenses, so if folks want to, so all the, all the um, gas stations and even some farms that have flammable combustible fluid storage, if they reach a certain limit, uh, we have to make sure that they're meeting the requirements for that. Um, There's an extremely long list. Fireworks, uh, we're responsible for ensuring that anybody that's doing a fireworks show is, is certified to do it. Uh, we also staff those shows to make sure that folks are safe. Um, mm -hmm. So pretty much, yeah, we're all over the place. What have I missed, Mike? What have I not asked you that do you think the town of Hadley might like to know? And I'm going to throw this out to you all, too, because Mike has given us so much information. Uh, and well done. Thanks. Um, you but missed is there... the fact that they will come and do your smoke detector or carbon dioxide detector Placement. Yes, yeah. So we do have a program with, uh, in coordination with the senior center. Um, anybody that needs assistance uh, changing a battery or changing smoke detectors out will come out and, and help you with that. Um, basically, what we do is we ask you if you, if you can afford it um, to just reimburse us for the cost of the detectors and we'll come through and do it. 
or if you can't, we have uh, we actually have grant funding available under the SAFE program with the State Fire Marshal's Office that we can purchase detectors if folks are in need and get them installed. Uh, the only ones that we can't really touch, but we can help you organize are hardwire detectors because technically you're supposed to be a licensed electrician to do that. So when I sold my house three years ago, I had to get some kind of new detectors in it because they were 30 years old. Mm -hmm. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. hey, they went off when I burnt the bacon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so detectors need to be replaced every 10 years. Um, the sensors actually, uh, I know they, they'll go off when you burn your, you know, your bacon or whatever, <laughs> but we're looking for the smoldering fire. So a candle that tips over and you have a small smoldering fire. The new detectors now pick that up very early. And then the other part is the carbon monoxide. Uh, believe it or not, we have a lot of carbon monoxide calls that are actually real carbon monoxide calls, not just a faulty alarm. But normally in the winter, if somebody hasn't cleaned their, you know, their oil burner or their gas burner, um, we, we do get a number of those calls. Uh, and it's a lifesaver. So that's actually under, under fire regulation as well. Uh, we also have the, we, uh, we really promote your numbering program that you have. So when we do the, the home inspections, we always tell them if you'd like to uh, contact the, you know, the Triad Senior Center uh, to get yourself one of those posts you can put out in the front yard, how helpful it is to us responding. And then we also uh, support the um, lockbox program. So we actually request a $30 donation that goes right back into our savings account to purchase the next batch of boxes. But if anybody's in need and can't afford it, we're not going to say no, we will get you a box. But if you, uh, if you have a family member or if you want us to have access to your home after hours, if there's a fall and you can't get to the door, uh, we'll come over, pick a location with you, we mount the box, and the code for that box is kept in our 911 database, there's only one number, only police and fire have access to it. And the reason why we did that is we were finding that if we had the family pick the number, we would go there and the son, the daughter had come over to visit, used the key and forgot to put it back in. So we were back to square one with not having the key again. So there's one number, it's all logged in the 911 database, who opens it, who takes it out to make sure it goes back. If it doesn't go back, we know who took it. We can make sure it's there, and um, that program's been very, very useful. I also have a little thing on a magnetized thing on my refrigerator that I've filled out with information. Is that something the fire people use when they come? You're talking about the file of life? File of life. Yes. So our, yes. So our, all, all of our firefighters are approved during the day, responds with the ambulance, and we've been asked that question, you know, why is there, uh, you know, a fire truck or our pickup going to medical calls. Uh, one of our priorities, believe it or not, it takes multiple hands uh, to get people out of their homes. It takes multiple hands if we're doing CPR. And it's allowing for us to have a quicker response, getting them into the ambulance, getting them to the hospital, and getting our ambulance back in service for the next call. So the file of life is critical for us. So it gives us your information. So if you're home alone or, you know, it answers questions, it, gives, it has your medication listed out for us, so we can just take that document right to the hospital or snap a picture of it. Uh, if you have uh, do not resuscitate or comfort care, you know, it, that gives us that information too, so we know where it is, um, so that we're following your wishes as well. And it gives contact info, so if you have a caregiver or if you have family that lives somewhere else, we, we have that contact info as well. And we just, that's one other thing, we have the 911 um, indicator forms that you can fill out through the police and fire departments. So if you have a, a medical condition or if you have, um, you know, if you're in a wheelchair or if you have some sort of a handicap that you need us to know about, you can fill out that 911 indicator and it's put into the 911 database. So if there's ever a call at your home, that information pops up for that emergency dispatcher and they can give that information to the responders so they, they know, you know, what's coming their way. Terrific, Mike. How about it? Questions? Um, so I, I was struck when you said the, the intensity of the fire can get up to 900 degrees. How do you, or how does the gear that the firemen wear 
um, how, how does that protect them? I mean, how does it protect them from being just overheated? Yeah. Especially about the weight that they have to carry. Yeah, uh, it's a challenge. So the turnout gear that we have, um, that that's why it's so important we get there quickly. But we are able to gauge what's going on in that atmosphere through what we're feeling in our turnout gear. Our turnout gear will handle 500, 600 degrees. So if we start feeling those 900 degrees, we're starting to feel that on our skin. And that's when we're realizing that it's either time to start backing ourselves out or we need to make sure that we're getting water onto something. Um, we need to have a water source uh, that's cooling, cooling this fire and ventilation. So um, again, that's the town has, when I, when I first started, my turnout gear was, you know, it was probably 20 plus years old. And this gear, you, we can't even attend a state training unless it's under 10 years of age. And you're talking about, you know, a set up turnout gear for, for us to buy new is, uh, you know, it's like close to $2,300 for a set. Um, and it, it's insulated and it allows our, so it separates our skin from that heat. There's all sorts of thermal layers and the material, it's, you know, it, it helps with that fire. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't burn until it gets to a, you know, a higher temperature. Um, so it does help. It does provide us, believe it or not, when we're, I mean, yes, it's absolutely ridiculously, it can be ridiculously hot. We're soaking wet, but actually it insulates us. So if, for example, I just did a burn day in Granby this past weekend uh, for some new recruits and, you know, we were nowhere near 900 degrees. We were maybe 500 degrees. But it was hot. It was, you know, outside just regular air was hot. But that gear kind of insulates you from that. And it takes a lot out of you. You know, you got to make sure you're hydrating and you hydrate two days ahead of time and just to make sure. But um, it does it does work. It does work really well. And the town has been just amazing. I, I applied for an assistance to firefighter grant through the federal government. We got a nice chunk to replace some of our turnout gear. Um, and then the town has, we have a capital plan now where every year we're keeping up with, where we purchase up to five sets of turnout gear to make sure, and it's staggered. Mm -hmm. So we're not having to buy 20 sets. We're, we're keeping up with those five and then it gets rotated out. Um, the other thing is, you know, when these guys are wearing this turnout gear during the day, it's, they have to wash it. It's got to be washed. So they need, they need something to be able to <coughs> respond to. So, you know, we're, we share some of our turnout gear. A lot of the guys, we're starting to give them the last generation that's still within that 10 years, they get it as a backup set. We're keeping some spares, so if they have to wash their gear, they'll, they'll still be able to respond to a call. So the town's been, has been really good about helping us with that. Hadley strikes again? Yeah. Great yeah. town. Yeah. yeah, I have one question. You mentioned the burn buildings as part of the training. Where does one find a burn building? <laughs> you just go set something on fire and <laughs> Sounds like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> so the next time you're heading up 47 North and the Sunderland Fire Department and Police mm -hmm. Department, if you take a look in the back, there's a big red trailer. It looks like a tractor trailer truck, the back end of it. That's actually a burn building. Ah. So there's two of them next to each other, and one is set up for us to do search and rescue that we can fill with smoke. And the other one allows us to do some limited fire evolution. So we put chunks of plywood in it, start it on fire, it gets up to temperature. We can actually show them how fire develops and what happens when we put water on it. Um, that steam coming down, that layer of smoke coming down, and then we can actually expose them to some of that heat. So they, they get an idea. Um, and they start looking for signs. You've all heard of flashover. Uh, so when a fire, it, it gets limited to oxygen. So it might be behind a closed door. It might be in a space that, you know, it's kind of just sitting there. It doesn't have enough oxygen to burn, but there's still so much heat in there and so much going on that as soon as somebody, you break a window or you open that door without being prepared with a hose line to get water in there, it just, reacts violently and just explodes. Everything is just incinerated. Um, so those are the things we're trying to teach them, that backdraft and, and flashover. So when everything in the room just gets up to temperature and ignites, that's, that's a flashover. And firefighters have zero time to get out of a space like that. So they really have to be looking for those signs.
I'm just impressed. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just go. <laughs> So the sprinklers were actually um, brought to our attention and we, we usually shut it off when we get close to that water pin so we're not watering and they are adjusting that. We're actually working with the contractor because that's a system that was new. Actually the DPW called me yesterday and we're actually working on that so their, their system apparently can detect when we have rain like that and shut it off. It's a new system for us so that's what we're working with the person who installed it so that will be corrected um, and the time frame. The reason why we put that sprinkler system in is the first lawn that was put in. It is there's so it's like close to 40 feet of sand there, um, so the grass we put on there like basically died instantly. So um, we we asked the town if they wanted us to be able to you know care for an actual lawn there. Um, so that's why the sprinkler was decided to put in there. But we're working on that. The lights were also another issue. The technology with lighting, it's, you know, we're used to a light switch it up and down. It's not like that anymore. So there's multiple sensors on there. And I think they fixed it now. They literally were working almost a year on it, but the lighting for the site goes off at night and it's on sensors. So the parking lot lights, it's a firefighter driving in that'll make it come up. And then the sign light and the uh, the, the lights on the door um, in the front entryway, uh, those those are supposed to go off. They're supposed to come on at dusk and go off at dawn. Yes, I said that right. Um, the interior lights are on motion, except for the bay lights. And again, that's the issue with the, um, the technology. And it's one thing that we're working on. So when we get a fire call, the folks that are responding to the station, the lights come on so that they're walking into a lighted area. The problem is, is getting them to shut off afterwards. So that program of that shutting off because they needed a switch at the door and it's the technology, we're just, we're working out the bugs on that. But yes, we are. Anyway, it sounds like the technology is there because I know there are some automated places where they have sprinkler system, mm -hmm. for example, they yeah. have them. You can even adjust them remotely and say, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. we did have five inches of rain last night. Right. Yep. You know, and you're working on it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. The berm. Um, so one of the biggest things for the site was none of the soil could leave the site from the excavation. Everything had to remain on site. Um, the berm to the north side, uh, which is up the residential houses on that. Uh, so the north side of it, um, that was done to try and create a little bit of a, a separation between the residents and the same on the south side. On top of that, there is a drainage swale there too that they had to build up so that it would contain that water. So I don't know if they would be able to decrease the size of that because it was... I think it's the southern the, one. The, the southern one, one. The south yeah. Side. It's the issue because the other one, driving, is not... You don't really notice side. it, yeah. It's not yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's any type of other measures that they could do to knock that that down. Yeah. Um, there's a little bit of water that's coming off the side of the road that would be there and that would be the issue with that. Yeah. That's where the drainage is that we need to make that part of that drainage, that drainage swale there. About it. More questions? I don't know what time we have, but I'm <laughs> conscious of that. But um, uh, didn't the town vote for a new ambulance this year, or a 
purpose, mm -hmm. in whatever. Yes. Um, yes. So how does that fit in then to your overall, what you're talking about, you know, the services that we do there? So that's going to be another asset to our fire department. So all of our, all of our folks, full-time folks are EMTs. And we have a great opportunity from Northampton to pick up one of the ambulances that they're taking out of service. So they have a five-year rotation. Um, actually, it's, they, they basically get a new ambulance every two years. So they're, this, this is a 2008, is it? 2009. So that's the last one in their rotation. So they keep getting one every two years. And it has an impeccable record. Um, and they're providing it to us so that we'll be able to start our first basic level of care ambulance service that will support our paramedic level. So right now, um, the contract is for an ALS ambulance, one paramedic level ambulance. If we have a multi-car accident or if we have a second medical call right now, during the hours, normally during the hours of 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., Action does have a base at the bridge where they have a backup basic level ambulance, but that travels between Hadley and Holyoke. So they're covering an area. Um, so if that ambulance has to respond to Holyoke, they are required under contract to either A, find another ambulance to come up to back up our paramedic level bus if it's out, or they have to notify us so that we can then go to mutual aid. So right now, with the number of calls that we have, we're, we're missing approximately 150 ambulance calls a year. Between 100 and 150 calls are going to the Med 2, which we don't get any of the revenue from, or an ALS intercept. So again, we're decreasing our response times. We're going back to the 10, 15 minute response times because we're getting the mutual aid from other communities. And there's been times where it's been, you know, they've had to say no, they don't have the ambulances themselves. Um, so we're gonna be adding another resource to this area uh, that if we have to, so let's say during the day we have a motor vehicle accident and our fire crew is out on the fire truck dealing with a motor vehicle accident, myself and the deputy can get into the ambulance or if there's a call force person available, a number of our call force folks are, are EMTs, we can staff that ambulance and the other part that we're looking at is we're looking at a hybrid. Uh, the University of Massachusetts, we're working with them on possibly partnering up. They have 130 EMTs during the school year, and we're looking to see if we can work out a partnership with them um, to help us operate that and see if we can obviously add a great resource to the community for, for our folks, um, but also to, you know, to just limit the number of calls that we're, we're missing. And, and see what that brings in for revenue for the, for the community and see if we can actually cover that cost for some additional staff overnight. I would like to wrap this up. This has been wonderful and great questions. Um, the one question that has been asked that most of us wonder, no, I'm not gonna, don't worry about it, Mike, it's okay. I wanna know where the red fire trucks went. <laughs> <laughs> we all love the red fire trucks. <laughs> yellow. yellow. No, Nancy doesn't like yellow either. <laughs> so do you want the real reason? Or, <laughs> or what we tell everybody? So, oh. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> so we tell everybody that when we go to these bigger calls, or if we're called mutual aid, which happens quite a bit, and there's a lot of red fire trucks there because everybody else has red fire trucks, it's real easy for us to find ours. We don't have to hit the little remote alarm on there to find our truck. So that's what we. That's that's one answer. But um, back in the '80s, there was actually they were considering legislation because of the color yellow was more of a highly visible color for response. They were actually looking at making the standard for a fire apparatus yellow. So at the time, we were in the process of getting a new truck. And so they decided to be proactive on that and paint that truck yellow. Obviously, everybody else had red trucks and wasn't anticipating painting them, so that that didn't that didn't work. And yellow trucks were became the that was what was happening. And when we built out our last truck in 2016, uh, when we were out in Wisconsin looking at all these new different colored trucks with red and black on top and. 
we actually sent out a Facebook post from Wisconsin, Brian was there, and we actually asked the question, what would you think if Hadley changed back to a red truck or a red with black on it? And they said, people were sending back saying, if you change the color of our trucks, we're moving out of town, we love yellow, <laughs> yellow's the color, so we made the executive decision to, to not change, and we're actually we're proud of our yellow trucks because it signifies Hadley, Hadley's, our crews are, I'm telling you, we're our mutual aid calls uh, that we get from Northampton and Amherst and everybody else. They're happy that Hadley's coming. We're, we've really professionalized our department over the years and we've built upon it. And I'm, I can't tell you how proud I am of all of them. They're all showing up and they're, they really make a difference. And so I thank them all. Two hours with Mike, I'm in love. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You're really an impressive guy, Mike, and Hadley is lucky to have you. So thank you for thank you. Thank you. We'll see you all in a month. Thanks.